Hey guys, this is Mel, and I am back to talk about part three of the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event happening in the Arrowverse. So, um, first off, part three is taking place during the Flash's episode 609, which premiered Tuesday, December 10th, 2019 on the CW. I'm recording on 1013 on the same night, so I just finished watching the Aftermath show that Kevin Smith was hosting on the CW. So got a little bit of spoilers and some insights from that. But otherwise, guys, if you haven't seen the episode already, please go do so first and then come back and see what I have to say about the episode. Uh, my other video reminders are up on screen, so take a moment to remind yourselves of those. As a very quick reminder, chances are you're going to get all three videos posted roughly uh, the same day. But I have recorded them all after their episodes have aired. So I'm not recording something already knowing what was happening like, I'm not recording one or two already knowing what happened in three. Like, you know what I mean? Um, so just stating for more of, like, prediction purposes and stuff like that. So I will try to do this in 20 minutes. Whether or not I succeed will be the question. Last two videos, I went past the timer. For some reason, number two, I paused the timer by accident when I clicked it. Um, so I just disregarded it altogether. And we all know how that turned out well. But, yeah. So I'll try to do this in 20. So let's start the clock. And let's begin with what happened in part three. So timeline-wise, we all know it just kicks right off from where season two or part two has ended, or not right off, but like you know, it continues on from the events, um, and the fact that we're still trying to find these paragons, which I'll talk about in a moment. So featured characters we have are from Supergirl. We get Kara, John Jones, Clark, and Lois. For Flash characters, we get Barry, Iris, uh, Cisco, who becomes Vibe once again because of the Monitor in this episode. We also get Frost and Caitlin, um, as well as Ralph and Pariah. So um, Cisco, Frost, slash Caitlin, and Ralph. This is their first episodes within the Crisis event. So there's that. From Arrow, we're getting Lila, Oliver, or a version of Oliver, Diggle with his first crossover appearance, and Mia once again. From Legends, we are getting Sarah, Ray, and Constantine, with uh, Mick being unaccounted for for this one. And then for Batwoman, we only have Kate Kane. So, new characters. There's a bunch of new characters. Well, technically, um, we'll start off with the Paragons. As we found out in uh, Part 2, that we need these seven beings of Paragon with the purest will who can help ultimately defeat the Anti-Monitor. And they're all scattered throughout space and time in the multiverse. Um, and then we find out that they're all supposed to... Well, we found out from Mark Guggenheim in the Aftermath show that these seven paragons are supposed to be representing different aspects of humanity. So we found out in part two that Kara of 38 is the paragon of hope. Sarah of Earth 1 is the paragon of destiny. Clark 96, which is Brandon Ralph's version of Superman, is the paragon of truth. Kate of Earth 1 is the paragon of courage. And then we find out in this episode that John Jones of 38 is the paragon of honor. Barry Allen of Earth One is the Paragon of Love. And new character Ryan Choi, played by Osric Chow, is the Paragon of Humanity. Ryan Chow is, or Choi is from Ivy Town. He's a big fan of Ray Palmer's um, in the whole scientific field and stuff like that. Uh, he's a husband. He's a new, uh, a new father to a six-month-old daughter. Um, so we get a little bit more backstory for that. Um, apparently, he... he Pass, he gets past the torch, not in this event, but he, in the comics, apparently he gets, he continues on the legacy for one of our known heroes. So um, that's all I will say about that, though. Um, but it was very, I will say this, though, because it's Osric, which who I love, it's now, now that he's in this crossover, now I'm thinking, well, Kevin Tran, they should have really brought Supernatural in here as one of the worlds because like, hello, they just crossed over a whole bunch of superhero worlds as well which is another one i'm going to be going into when it comes to new characters and it's like why not have supernatural be one of the worlds because like they did establish in supernatural that there is a multiverse of worlds but they haven't really touched back on it it was mainly focused on in season 13 um so that's just something there but anyways let's just move on to these characters so we do get for new characters we get lucifer morningstar from earth 666 and he's actually by uh, played by Tom Ellis, and he is the Lucifer from the Netflix series Lucifer. So, I mean, I heard rumors about possibly that happening, but I I thought it was just hopeful thinking, or like uh, people are just trying to find Easter eggs where there weren't. So the fact that he showed up was just a surprise right there, which I will talk about later. 
Can you guess which section I'm going to be talking about that? So there's that. We also get Jeff- Jefferson Pierce, a.k.a. Black Lightning, um, joining in on the fold. As we know, this week's episode of Black Lightning really was kind of like his own lead in into the crisis. And um, it, the episode ended with his world being destroyed and him being saved by Pariah and being brought to Earth 1. Although, I don't know if I missed it. So if someone has answered this, please let me know in the comments down below. I don't think they labeled which Earth black lightning was coming from now i watched the his his episode which kind of it didn't confuse me but like when we're dealing with um with his daughter jennifer she was dealing with two other versions of herself so we got the gen of the black lightning universe and they got gen of one earth and gen of the other earth but i'm pretty sure i don't know if they actually labeled them as actually like gen of earth one and then gen of earth two or if it was just like just to differentiate the fact that this is one gen, this is another gen, or if it really is like gen from Earth 1 and gen from Earth 2. Because the only reason I would have that question is because Earth 2 was destroyed back in October when we see in um, the season premiere of Arrow. So it's like it couldn't, she couldn't have been from Earth 2. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where the confusion is and kind of why I want to know what exactly, what Earth number he's coming from. So that's something there. Anyways, we also get the return of Barry Allen of Earth-90, which is being played by John Wesley Shipp. Uh, we also do get a moment of seeing just a scene from the a pilot episode, I believe, from the, the 90s Flash series, where it was an exchange between Barry and Tina. And from the um, the Aftermath show, they uh, Mark Guggenheim actually shared that that flashback moment or that clip insert was not in the script. It was just something that they were able to do in post-production. So that was a cool little insight into that. And then also, I'm going to count it as a new character, but we do get Oliver's soul on Lian Yu, which is Oliver's version of Purgatory, which is a really weird... It's a perfect play on words, but when you're trying to explain it to somebody, it just seems like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. So we know Oliver died. His soul went to hell. So his, his soul thinks of his hell as being back on the island which happened to be which happens to be named purgatory so that's where we see his soul persona i guess you could say so there's that so first scene of the episode is earth uh 203 being destroyed now earth 203 is housing the um birds of prey um series that took place in the early 2000s um so it was a brief moment, but we do see the antimatter wave uh, consume um, everybody there, which I will talk about in a little, in a little moment. Or maybe I'll say it right now. Um, so Birds of Prey, like I said, we do see um, Ashley Scott playing Helena or the Huntress, and she is trying to get into communications with the Oracle of her world before the, the wave uh, consumes her. Um, so that is something there. But moving on to storylines very quickly, I picked up on four different ones being focused on in this episode. First one being restoring Oliver's soul. Second one being recruiting Ryan Choi. Third one being stopping the antimatter wave. And th- four being Supergirl versus Batwoman. So um, the fourth one is the only one that takes place on the Wave Rider. But uh, one, two, and three take place on throughout the, the world pretty much. So in regards to the first storyline, we're starting Oliver's soul. This is what takes us to Earth 666 to Lucifer because Constantine needs a, a ticket down to Purgatory so that they can uh, retrieve Oliver's soul and bring him back to his body. Oliver's soul somehow stays behind after refusing to go back due to a specter. Now, from my understanding, the specter told him that he, I'm thinking that the, t- the specter told Oliver's soul that he can't leave because he he is needed to save the universe or something. I don't know, but he definitely didn't return with Diggle, Constantine, or Mia. So I'm a little confused about what happened there. Um, but we got to see a different version of Oliver because this Oliver literally was the one that was on the island. So the one that we are first see in the uh, flashbacks from season one. So that was a little bit of a trip down memory lane there. Um, second storyline is recruiting Brian Choi, who is in Ivy Town. Um, as he was labeled the Paragon of Humanity, we have Iris, Ralph, and Ray going there to recruit him. Uh, Ryan is a big fan of Ray uh, on a scientific level, but then when Ralph used his powers to prove that um, they were superheroes, Ryan knew that those powers were associated with Elongated Man. So that's a little something there about Reach. 
Um, but eventually he does agree to come back and help them. So there is that. And he's just human, so there's no meta, meta powers or anything like that. Third storyline is dealing with the antimatter wave. So this is where we get the cosmic treadmill in the uh, anti-monitors um, cave that is below um, Central City that Nash is trying to get into. We do find out that um, Pariah lost the memories of Nash Wells the moment that the anti-monitor took control. So with Vibe's powers, they found the code that entered into that weird room, and that is where the cosmic treadmill was. And we find that Barry from Earth-90 has been stuck on that treadmill since he was recaptured, which I will... Will I bring that up now? Yeah, I'll bring that up now. So, like, after... Since the monitor sent Barry... Barry-90 away in Elseworlds, shortly after that, the anti monitor got a hold of him and kind of thrust him into the cosmic treadmill... And put a sail fail safe that if he stopped running, it would self destruct and set off this massive wave that would destroy the whole multiverse. So that has led maybe Barry running for the last year or so, from the looks of it. Um, so that is something there. And then also, this is where Black Lightning enters the scene and he helps them by absorbing the power of the machine long enough for them to figure out what they need to do to. Um, to stop it and that is reverse the power and reverse polarity and actually have them force the power back into the machine and combust it that way which results in barry getting ready to sacrifice himself but his earth 90 counterpart doing it in his place instead so that's something there now with the four star line with supergirl versus batwoman it is mainly between kara trying to like fight with kate about using the book of destiny to not only restore earth 38 but all the other earths in the multiverse Kara really wants to save all the people that were lost, but Kate is more worried over the fact that this could destroy Kara, and if it destroys Kara, then that means they lose their Paragon of Hope, who is supposed to be one of the seven pillars to help them stop the Anti-Monitor. So they're at pretty much of an impasse there. A lot, it's a lot of uh, struggles and a lot of um, a lot of um, debate on them proving their own Paragon stature. Whether Kate is has the courage to stand up against the Kryptonia and if Kara will still have the hope to fight if she is not able to save everybody type of thing. And it really puts their own Paragons into perspective as well as have them each showcasing their own. Like Kate having hope that they can find a way to defeat all of this while um, Supergirl believes that she now has, she sees the courage in um, Kate or something like that or has the courage that Kate won't be needing the kryptonian the kryptonite to use against her or something like that but there's definitely some conflict there when in the part two we were seeing them getting closer on a friendship level so that is something there now the last thing of the episode shows um pariah sending the uh, paragons to the vanishing point to escape the anti-monitor and his antimatter wave but then we find out that lex seemed to have impersonated Clark 96 or he took his place as one of the Paragons from my understanding. I will come across that in a moment as well. Um, so that's how it ends there. Which sucks because now I gotta wait five weeks for part four and five to air on January 14th. So that's just like anyone wishing that we just had five days straight of the crossover because like I can't wait. It's like waiting for this is like i want my winter break to be over already it's like i don't want that i want to actually enjoy my winter break but yeah so there's that so let's move on to tidbits very quickly um we do see this episode being um the episode where team flash learns of the early destruction of earth 2 they even name drop um harry and jesse wells um so they found out that they were gone long before this crisis wave started hitting the earth so rapidly so there's that we have lois learning a little bit more about the anti-monitor and his home we have the monitor's energy somehow going to the anti-monitor when he was defeated and this is what started the anti-monitor wave that the flash team had temporarily stopped with barry 90s uh, sacrifice um, also by the end of this episode all the earths have been destroyed and the only survivors of the multiverse are lex and the six paragons in the vanishing point and possibly lila I'm uncertain if the anti monitor is still possessing her or not. Um, so there's that. But based off, I thought Pariah might have been uh, someone as well who might be potentially still be alive. But in the uh, in the Kevin Smith's aftermath in memorum section, they included Par Pariah as as one of the dead characters. They also included uh, Clark ninety six as well too. 
Um, so I will talk about it in a little bit more. But let's move on to the most shocking moment of the episode. I think it is the fact that all of the multiverse is destroyed. I mean, I don't know. I think, I mean, I knew it would get pretty close to it. And I thought maybe Earth 1 would be the sole surviving Earth, therefore collapsing all the shows onto each other. But then I didn't think they'd actually destroy Earth 1 as well, too. And then actually further on and destroy those who were on the Wave Rider, too. Like, you know what I mean? Um, so that was just a huge stunning point there. It's like they shocked me like they did with uh, Oliver's death in part one. So that is something there. Uh, but let's move on to top three favorite moments. This one, I definitely had a lot more favorites. I don't know if it's just because there's a lot of tiny favorites that I had or if it was just a lot more bigger favorites. But let's go right through it now. First one was the fact that we got the Lucifer cameo. I mean, I, I don't watch Lucifer, but I know who he is and, and the gist of what it's about. But that was completely unexpected for me. I mean, for the Smallville one, I kind of already knew about that one. So I was waiting for that one. For Brandon Ralph coming back as Superman, I already knew about that one. So I was waiting about for that one. And I knew that there'd be other DC um, project cameos, like with um, the Birds of Prey, with um, the other Batman movies, and like the old school stuff. So I knew there was something like that. So I'm not really as hyped because I didn't watch it when, from before. But I knew they were going to happen. But for Lucifer, which I didn't think would be any way connected to the Arrowverse until I found out about the aftermath that it is based off of a DC character, that it still blew my mind. But also, here's something as well, though, for Shadowhunter fans. Did anyone else get a little bit giddy when Lucifer was talking to Mia and he introduced her as Lucifer Morningstar and she's like questioning that. But then also you remember from Shadowhunters, Mia, a.k.a. Kat McNamara, used to play Clarissa Morgenstern, who had a family re- relic called the Morning Star Sword. I mean, like the Morning S- Morgenstern family, if I remember correctly, had their whole family mythos about descending from Lucifer as being these half angel, half human hunters, right? So it's just like when he was looking at her and he was introducing herself and she was reacting to the name Morning Star, I was like, shit, it's Clary meeting Lucifer right now. It's just like another crossover idea even further on than the crossover we're currently in right now. So that's like kind of one of my favorites is because of that exchange and because it had me thinking of uh, Shadowhunters. So that's one there. Another favorite I did have was the moment that we actually got with uh, Barry and Jefferson. Not only when they first meet and it's very high tension because of the time constraint that they had, but also the moment that they have on the Wave Rider when they're sharing their whole little past with their own um their own fathers and how like the different worlds that they're coming from and then just that moment leading up to them introducing for themselves who they are I thought that was really great I thought it definitely showcased the parallels that they had with each other and it was just like a way for them to bond over the fact that we're fighting for the same thing I understand what you're going through or to an extent I understand what you're feeling so it was just a great moment to have between them. And I truly appreciate that. I mean, with Black Lightning, I was a little worried that it would just be like a quick cameo. Like we'd get, like we got with the Smallville characters. Just go quick in and out. But with this one, he was actually interacting with the characters. He was actually making, um, making, um, making friendships and stuff like that. Or not purposely, but you know what I mean? Like building connections and stuff. So it's really nice to see that. Another favorite I did have was just seeing Team Flash working together again, seeing, especially with it being Barry, Cisco, and Frost, slash Caitlin a little bit at the end, to just see them working together, try to figure out this Flash-related problem. It was just like, I miss that for sure, um, especially with the past season. We don't really get much of it because it's Barry focusing on certain people in preparation for him leaving. So um, it was just great to see the original trio. And then also bring it back when they were having their goodbye hug and how he was saying, like, um, you guys are the first people I saw when um, when I woke up. I wouldn't be a hero if it weren't for you guys type of thing. So it was just like a really great uh, friendship moment for the three of them. So that's something there. Another fa- favorite I did have was Kara and Kate once again. I mean, the fact that we have the debate about them. I mean, the last two parts, they both have been killing it together, building their friendship, but then also to standing their ground for what they believe in and knowing that like what you're doing is wrong and I will stand in front of you. I stand against you even though I don't want to and so it was just like it was a great dynamic we got to see with them so I truly appreciate that another favorite I did have was Diggle and specifically his words about Oliver's death and then to uh, Oliver's soul in particular he Diggle is just refusing the notion that Oliver is dead he's on board with trying to do everything he can to bring him back 
Uh, also, when he's talking to Oliver Soul and trying to bring him out of this ha- this memory haze and saying, like, um, you're my brother. I'm sorry I left you. I won't leave you now. Just come back to us type of thing. And it's just like, I truly appreciate it. And I love that it was those words that really knocked Oliver back into his senses and have them have that hug. It's just like, they've been through so much since the pilot episode. And it's just great to see how far they've come and like truly have that um emphasize because also it, it did suck the fact that Diggle wasn't there in Oliver's final moments and like he even feels guilty over the fact that like I'm sorry I couldn't I wasn't there for you but I won't leave you now type of thing so I truly appreciate that uh, so that's something there and then also just a side bonus is just the reactions we get from other characters about the whole superhero situation so there's Ralph's initial reaction when he meets all the super friends because this is his first official crossover moment where he's actually seeing them everyone all dressed up and ready for battle type of thing you know the, the lineup look tight and I pretty much viewed Ralph's reaction to being like us as the fans reaction like if we were ever put in his situation I'm pretty sure all of us would be like whoa and like this is not happening right now just like trying to like be calm and cool but then you're also like freaking out on the inside so I feel like Ralph was all of us in that moment so that's one there. Another moment, and there's the timer, was uh, Jefferson's reaction to the fact that there's two Supermans. And the fact that he was saying, like, he even confirmed that there is no Superman on his Earth because he was like, oh, so Superman's real here type of thing. So if anything, they might have the comic of Superman over there. So it's just really cool to have that little throw-in line to at least know, like, what the situation is. I mean, it's kind of the same with Supernatural because they're... I'm assuming there's no Superman over there because they do have the Superman and Batman comics that the Winchesters grew up on. So I'd feel like it's kind of the similar situation like um, what Earth-1 initially dealt with and then also with what Jefferson's Earth is dealing with. So it's just a cool little throwaway comment there. And then also another superhero reaction is Ryan Choi, just his reaction to Ray Palmer on a human identity level when it came to scientific discoveries, but then also his reaction to Elongated Man. And it's not like this part's, oh my god, I'm a huge fan, but it's more of like, oh crap, you're, you're, I know who you are, you're, and then you're a long eating man type of thing. So it's pretty interesting to see all these varying different uh, uh, reactions you can get from seeing the super friends in action. So that's something there. But let's move on to top three peak moments. I really can't believe that the timer went off, but then again, I can in a way. So there's that. But top three peak moments, I did have two. I was trying to figure out which one I could think of because it was harder to, to sense one. But the first peeve I did have was Barry of Earth-90 taking Barry's place. And I know a lot of people would be like, no, that's a relief. Grant Gustin is still going to be playing Barry Allen and we don't have to lose him in the crisis. And like, I get that. I do. But the fact that people are saying it's a plot to twist when it really wasn't, because the moment you know that um, John Wesley Ship is going to be co- being on the show, First off, he's multiple characters in the series, so it's now figuring out which character he's going to be playing. And then once you figure out that, like, oh, he's going to be play, playing the Flash, and then there's the whole play on words. It's kind of like when we had Savitar, and he had the thing, like, I am the future Flash. Everyone just assumed that there was a comma between future and Flash instead of him being, like, actually the future Flash. So it's like one of those situations there when the monitor was even saying, like, the Flash had to die in crisis, but he never specified which Flash had to die. So in this case, it makes sense and why it couldn't be Jay Garrick's Flash because it's different because both of these versions of the Flash were both named Barry Allen. So it could be either one of them. So it just like, I felt like it, once you knew that he was playing Barry Allen of Earth-90, there was a significant increase in chance that it would be him that would sacrifice himself instead of our Barry. Um, Plus also, if you're going to name Barry of Earth-1 the Paragon of Love, there's no chance that he's going to die before the final battle, especially when it, they set up the fact that the Paragons are supposed to be a huge factor to defeat the Anti-Monitor. But now that what happened with the Paragon of Truth, I'm questioning that reasoning. But that is why it's an initial P, because it's not the twist that everyone is playing it up to be. There's no way. Plus also the fact that everyone knew that the Flash wasn't going to die, because otherwise what's happening to the rest the second portion of the flash series of the season you know what i mean so it's just like yeah so that was a peeve there the fact that they played up a plot twist that really 
was expected and it wasn't really a plot twist. Plot twist was having Oliver killed off in part one. Plot twist was the fact that the multiverse was actually destroyed and not just like it. The multiverse actually being destroyed was like more of like the end of Infinity War when Thanos actually snapped half the universe out of existence. So it's just like more of like, oh, holy fuck, it, it actually got to that point type of thing. But anyways, I, I digress. The second peeve that I had was another reporter comment. And that was from Lois when she was talking to the monitor. And she was saying she was saying something along the lines of the fact that this is the biggest event of existence. And no one was going to be around to read this story. I just got so fed up by that because it's like, hello, the world is ending. How could you think in regards to a reporter story in a time like this? I kept thinking priorities. Hello, you not only have to figure out how you're going to survive this crisis, but you also have a baby to to protect during this crisis. And you're here worrying about the story of the millennia type of situation going on. It's like, uh, hello, worry about surviving first. And then if you survive and everyone else does then worry about writing the story of the century or whatever, right? It was just, like, all about priorities. It's, like, really? A peeve of mine is, like, if you can't keep your priorities straight and make a comment like that, it's, like, no. I'm going to notice it, and I'm going to harsh on it so much. So that was a peeve there. But let's move on to crossover hopes. Um, I did mention in the part one and part two about the duplicate um, portrayals and how they would handle it. Since we kind of both got them covered or covered or not in part two, I'm not going to talk about it a little bit more. If you do want to know more about that, though, check out my part two video. It should be up now, chronologically speaking. But yeah, so there's that. But again, another hope. We did not get this in this episode, so I'm still hoping that part four or part five will establish this. But it is in regards to Batwoman and where exactly in her history as batwoman does the events of elseworlds follow because as you know in this in the crossover itself it has stated that elseworlds took place one year ago and one year ago kate was batwoman with the red wig and everything but as you all know if you follow batwoman that kate the series starts off with kate becoming batwoman and she does not wear the red wig and she doesn't start wearing the red wig until episode 103 but these events are supposedly having take place in october so i'm assuming it's been like three months of her being batwoman before crisis started so i'm left wondering if that is the case then how the hell was she batwoman one year ago unless i missed a time jump that happened between season one episodes and i'm just not aware of it please let me know because i really want to know where in her becoming Batwoman and wearing the red wig to Crisis, where does Elseworlds fit into it when Elseworlds and Crisis are supposed to have been a year apart? So that's a concern I have because I really want that addressed. And that is always some, as you know, if you watch any of my Arrowverse shows, one huge peeve that I will always have, always have that's constant is continuity within the universe. Supergirl usually gets a pass because it's on Earth-38, so I can understand why some things could happen there that wouldn't affect anything on Earth-1. But anything that happens on Earth-1 on a global scale, and it's not mentioned in any of the other Earth-1 shows, I'm left criticizing over the fact that why that's not the case. Did you just suddenly forget that you're part of that universe as well, and you're just, like, hoping nobody notices? Well, guess what? I notice. I'm a stickler for details for these type of things, for mythology-based things. Other stuff, I might just overlook it. But it's usually the mythology behind it is when I, my brain gets cracking. So anyways, there's that. Let's move on to random questions very quickly. The question I did have was about the very ending. And that is the question of whether Lex replaced Clark 96 in The Vanishing Point. Or was it just him in disguise all this time and he just got mistaken as Clark 20, 96? Or did he actually kill Clark to take his spot in The Vanishing Point? Because then also, if Clark is actually dead because of Lex's switcheroo or because he killed him in that moment, what does that mean for the Paragon of Truth? But then I'm left thinking of the scroll when Lex wrote his name over the symbol, and I'm left wondering if Lex had rewritten himself to be the new Paragon of Truth instead of Clark 96. So which of those scenarios is what I'm dealing with right now? Because that ending definitely has me having more questions than answers. 
So that's one there. Second question. Earth 1 is the only surviving Earth, as we know. But then I am left wondering, what happened to Earth 666 with the show Lucifer? Because isn't that currently in its final season right now on Netflix? That's the question right there. Um, so that's something. And the last question, with the whole multiverse being destroyed, how exactly can we come back from this? This isn't, nece- this isn't a Thanos snap moment. Thanos snapped people out of existence. He didn't destroy worlds. He didn't like he didn't like destroy the actual plants themselves that take billions upon billions of years to form. He just got rid of the inhabitants on top of it. But this one is like true annihilation of everything in its path. So how exactly are our heroes going to come back from this? If time travel is not an option because that just messes things up further and they're told not to do that, or if the Book of Destiny is not an option because doing so on that large of a magnitude could result in the person going insane. What are we to do from this point? That is the big question here. I definitely have no idea theory-wise, um, but please let me know in the comments down below. I'd really love to know what you have to think about that. But let's move on to predictions very quickly. This is going to be short because we're over two weeks from everything. But based off the promo for episode four, again, comes back January 14th, 2020. Also, both part four and part five are going to be airing the same night back to back. So just keep that in mind as well. But it looks like we're going to see Barry in the Speed Force. And it looks like Oliver is going to be the spokesperson for it. And it looks like the Anti-Monitor is the is in the dawn or at the dawn of time. There's supposed to be some fight in a quarry or something. I have no idea. Um, but it's going to be a long while before we can see that. Just a little bit over a month. Um, and because of that, the synopsis for Part 4 or Part 5 are not posted yet. As you know, Futon Critic only posts synopses for the episodes two weeks in advance. So we're going to have to wait until after just after the new year before we can figure out any inkling of what is to come so keep that in mind as well also as i mentioned at the very beginning i did watch kevin smith host the crisis of infinite earth aftermath show and we do learn a little few spoilerish things there they did also do the world premiere of a new cw series called star girl which is set to premiere in spring of 2020 so that is something there um it was pretty good from the looks of it and very interested to see the only star girl i know is the one that was introduced on legends of tomorrow in season two and she doesn't really give you much as well either um so that is something there hold on um and then also they did talk a little bit about a legends of tomorrow um since legends technically airs its next season after the whole crisis event they did reveal that um The scope of Season 5 for Legends is dealing with the fallout of Crisis, and their mythology for the season is tied into what happened with Crisis. So that's going to be a little bit interesting in there. As you know, Season 4 of uh, Legends ended with uh, Souls from Hell possibly returning to Earth and wreaking havoc on it due to Astra. We do also see a huge shift in the timeline because of Zari. Um, Her future of 2042 got changed, so now... She is not with the Legends anymore. It's her brother instead. Um, Also, monsters or creatures have been introduced to the world in a friendly manner. The Legends have been introduced to the world. And also, that hasn't been continuity-based in The Flash or on Arrow so far this year. So, that's a little issue I have there. Also, they they did say that Sarah, in um, the Part 5 of the Crossover event, the Legends portion of it, will see uh, Sarah taking on a huge role as leader, and this is also where we see the final confrontation with the Anti-Monitor, so that's something to look forward as well, as well as wonderful cameos to come, as well as a huge epic fight to come. So that is all that they revealed in the aftermath, otherwise they did talk about with some uh, major key players uh, uh, that uh, guest starred in the first three parts. Um, but that is pretty much it, guys. So what did you guys think of the episode? What did you guys like about it? What do you think as a crossover as a whole so far? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your own thoughts, theories, and opinions about all that. I'll definitely share my overall thoughts with the crossover in part five. Also, I might do my video for part four and part five together because they are airing the same night. So just be on the lookout for that. 
Also, um, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, check my other videos if you haven't done so already. If you want, check out my Tumblr page, link for that is down below. I reblog promos, web clips, quotes, gifs, and off-season news, all that good stuff, all found in one place. Go check that out. I am behind, mainly because I am in my last two weeks of my semester right now. I've got a lot of final projects um, being due or final exams I have to study for. Um, I actually wrote one final exam today. and I got two more to go for next week, and I got like th three or four final projects I got to do um, that are due next week as well. So I got a lot on my plate. Um, so just keep that in mind, but I'm hoping once my winter break officially starts, I'll get back on Tumblr and just start re-uploading a whole bunch of updates and stuff like that and try to get back into it. WordPress account, link for that is down below. Anything I post online is connected to WordPress. It's the same thing, a little more organized, a little more detailed, but again, I have to update that one. It's, it's going to take some time for that. Usually up, updating is just adding the, this year's new links for sure. But otherwise guys, that is pretty much it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for your patience. I hope you come back um, next time to see what I have to say about the last two parts of the crossover. So that's in the new year. If not, I hope you check out my other videos on my channel. I know I still have the next ones I will have will be the mid-season finale videos for um, Supernatural and Legacies. And then I think I'll have my own little holiday break um, from making videos so I can do Tumblr or um, WordPress updates or just actually having a winter break and or maybe i'll even focus on writing my own stuff um before school starts back up again that's the plan who knows but i do hope you guys check out my other stuff as well um but until then guys this is mel wish you all a great day great week wherever you are bye for now